Financial Modeling, Topic 11, Fixed Income Portfolio Optimization, Copyright Lou Gaddis. In this topic, we're going to talk about managing the interest rate risk of a fixed income portfolio, computing portfolio value, income, duration, and convexity, effective duration, and then we're going to optimize portfolios using duration and convexity and income. Now, the one thing we're going to look at uh, compared to the last topic is when you form portfolios of assets, the portfolio duration is simply the market value weighted duration and the portfolio convexity is the market value weighted convexity. One method to mitigate a firm's exposure to changes in interest rates is to set the duration of assets equal to the duration of liabilities. So let's start with an example of a pension fund. Say you uh, have estimated that you have pension liabilities of the following. A year from now, I expect to spend $10,000. Two years from now is $9,000. Down to 30 years from now, $471. So these are my liabilities. And for the pension to be fully funded, we'll need to have assets set aside equal to the value of these pension liabilities. Let's assume the discount rate is 4.5%. We can calculate the value of these pension liabilities. So I'll just type in my NPV formula, or I'll put in the discount rate. And I'm going to anchor that. And then I'll put in my pension cash flows. And I'll anchor that. So you can see these pension liabilities have a present value of $68,000. So for the firm to remain solvent, they'd have to set aside assets of $68,000. And the question is, well, what type of assets would I want to hold to reduce the risk of interest rates changing and my pension liabilities and asset values not moving in sync? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invest a portfolio of bonds or invest in a portfolio of bonds with a market value of $68,000. And I'm going to select the bonds such that the duration of the bonds are equal to the duration of these liabilities. Now, On the last topic, topic 10, we talked about the duration of a uh, single bond and that was a analytical solution meaning it was a formula derived from taking the first derivative of the bond uh, cash flow function, value function, with respect to yield. When you have a random set of cash flows like this, uh, you can't use a function like that. So we're going to use more of a numeric process. We're going to calculate the NPV of the cash flows and then shock the interest rates up plus or minus 100 basis points see what the percent change of the in the value is and then take the average percent change for 100 basis point change in rates and we're going to call that effective duration so remember that uh, one interpretation of duration of a bond is if the duration of a bond is say 5 that means that the a linear estimate of the value change is 5% for a plus or minus 100 basis point change in the yield. Well, we can think of this as the yield, and we're just going to shock the yield plus or minus 100 basis points. So I'll take my NPV formula, and I'll subtract 0.01. So I'll value the cash flows at 3.5%. I get 72,000. And then I'll value the cash flows plus 1. And it's worth $63,000. So you can see as the rates go up and down, the value of that portfolio of liabilities goes up or down. Let me calculate the percent change. When it goes from 68 to 72, that is a 7% change. And then when it goes from 68, to 63, that's a negative 6% change. So rates are changing 7 and 6.9 for plus or minus 100 basis point change. So this one was NPV minus 100 basis points and this one was NPV plus 100 basis points. Let me just take the, uh, so let's call that the percent change. 
let's take the absolute value of the percent change so I'll just take the absolute value of each one and then I'll take the average of the absolute value So on average, when rates are plus or minus 100 basis point change, on average it's a 6.59% change in value. I'm going to call that my effective duration. I'll highlight that. All right. So now the, the trick is I need to, and for this pension to be fully funded, I want to make sure the present value of my pension liabilities is equal to the present value of the bonds I'm going to invest or the assets I'm going to hold against it. And I also want to make sure that my duration is equal to the duration of my liabilities. Actually, I shouldn't call this effective duration yet. Effective duration is actually going to be that percentage times 100. Because duration is always quoted in whole numbers. So I'll we'll actually quote it this way. The duration of this portfolio is 6.59 years. So I've pre-selected a number of bonds. But before we look at those bonds, I'm going to take my functions for calculate the duration of a bond, the convexity of the bond, and the value of a bond. I'll go to my developer Visual Basic, insert a module. And I'll paste those functions into my spreadsheet module. I'll then take my mix of bonds I'm looking about adding. I'm going to add 1, 5, 10, and 30 year bonds. I want a mix of 1s, 5s, 10s, and 30s. And I just copied that here. So now all I'm going to try to do is try to get a mix of 1, 5, 10, and 30 year bonds have the market value of 68,000 and a duration of 659. So we'll start off with quantities of 1. That's eventually what I'm going to solve for. I'll highlight that. And let's go ahead and put our Excel functions in for duration and convexity. Duration, coupon, par, maturity, frequency, and the discount rate or yield. So the one year bond has a duration of about one, and the 30 year bond has a duration of about 14 and a half. I'll do the same thing with convexity, coupon. Par, maturity, frequency, yield. And then I'll calculate the total value of the bonds by inserting bond val, which is a function that values non callable coupon bonds. So I'm going to put in my coupon. Par, frequency, or I'm sorry, maturity, frequency is number of payments per year, and yield. And let me do one more thing. I want to take that bond val and just multiply times the quantity. That way, if I make the quantity say five, it'll be the value of all five bonds. And I'll copy that down. And then the last thing I'll do is I'll calculate the income generated from these bonds. So if I have five one-year bonds, has a par of 1,000 and a coupon of 2.5, that is my coupon interest or my interest income from those bonds. And I'll add those up using my shortcut Alt equals under a cell and add these up. So the bonds now have a total value of 19,000 and income of 800. 
And then I'm going to calculate the weighted average duration and convexity. And I'm going to use a simple formula for counting, calculating a weighted average. So normally the weighted average duration would be, say, uh, $5,000 over 19 times 1 plus 5,000 over 19 times 4, 6 plus 5,000 over 19. So it's a weighted average. So, but I'm going to use a little trick, sum product. Take your durations, comma, your values. I'm actually going to anchor that because I'm going to copy this formula. So now it's just going to take a sum product of these two columns. And then to get the weighted average, I need to divide by total value. I'll anchor that. So there's my weighted average duration, seven years, and weighted average convexity, 104 units. So if I look at this match, it's not working so far, or too well so far. I need to get 68,000 equal to the market value of my assets. And I'd like to get the durations to be equal. And then lastly, when I'm running solver, I might as well put in a, an objective function. So what I'm going to do is this portfolio, I want to maximize income with a constraint by changing these three weights, constraining them to be positive. With two constraints, one is the duration of this portfolio is 659, and the value is 68,000. So I'm going to go to my solver. I'm going to maximize portfolio income by changing these three weights. Add first constraint. Duration equal to 659. So this duration equal to 659. And a second constraint, this value equal to 68,000. So there's my solver, maximize portfolio income by changing the number of bonds with a constraint that duration 7 and the value 68,000. And there's my solution. So now we would feel a little more comfortable that if, say, interest rates were to change, the value of these bonds would change, but also the value of these assets, at least as a first linear approximation using duration, would have a similar value change, and therefore I'd be remain fully funded. Now, one other optimization we can do is what if we don't care as much about current period income or we're more worried about remaining solvent? You know, so you're more focused on market value, say market value of assets equal to market value of liabilities. You can run a different solver. All right, so look at this portfolio here as convexity of 61 units. We can run a portfolio that maximizes convexity. So now I have 133 units of convexity. Looks like income went down a little bit. So the trade-off here is if I maximize income, that's going to generate positive interest income for the year. But if interest rates change, I'd prefer to have a portfolio with more positive convexity. Therefore, after the interest rate change, my convexity adjustments, uh, after I use my duration, is going to be positive. So I'm going to, I'm going to be in a better market value position by maximizing convexity. So that's uh, how I think about hedging a cash stream, and in this case a pension liability. I do that by holding a bond portfolio at the same duration and either maybe maximizing convexity or maximizing income. Now one risk I want to show you is with this solution here. If you notice this solution here, this is for maximizing convexity. In finance, we'll call this solution right here a bell a barbell solution or a barbell strategy and it often comes up while maximizing convexity. Notice that convexity of a 30-year bond is almost 300 times the convexity of a one-year bond. So if you're trying to maximize convexity what you really want to do is buy a lot of 30-year bonds. But when you buy a lot of 30-year bonds you're going to increase your durations so you bring it down by then uh, holding one-year bonds. 
So the bottom line is a combination of one-year bonds and 30-year bonds are going to give you greater convexity than, say, an even distribution of these three, four because convexity is increasing exponentially, or at least increasing at an increasing rate. Now, the risk of this strategy is to a yield curve reshaping. And this really makes you think about what duration measures. Duration measures the percent change, a linear approximation of a percent change in value for a 100 basis point parallel shift in the yield curve. In other words, all maturities, interest rates go up or down 100 basis points. Now, the risk of this is actually looking at this cash flow here. You can see I have a little bit of one year, two year, three year exposure down to a little bit of 30 year exposure. So this is my liability. And then if I go with this strategy, I really just have one year exposure and 30 year exposure. In other words, I'm, I'm exposed to a change in a 30 year rate and the one year rate. Where this one, I have a little exposure to the one year rate, a little exposure to the 30 year rate, but a lot of exposure in the middle. So the risk of one of the main risks of this strategy as far as interest rate risk is that the yield curve moves in a non-parallel fashion or the yield curve reshapes. You can think about it. What would be the worst case scenario for this hedge? The worst case scenario is here are my liabilities. These are my assets. I have a huge exposure, a long, you know, a long duration here on the 30 year. If simply the 30 year rate drops, you know, say the Fed starts some quantitative easing on a 30 year bond, and the 30-year uh, rate uh, goes up or down, this value is going to go way up or way down because I have a lot of, you know, I have $28,000 worth of 30-year uh, bonds for the duration of, uh, of 14. So if that 30-year uh, rate were to say go up, I would lose a lot of my asset. On the other hand, I only have a little exposure on the liability side. So once you put on a duration hedge, you still are exposed to yield curve reshaping. Now one strategy to, or another strategy you can use instead of using say duration matching would be an old fashioned type of solution. Well, if I estimate all these cash flows, what I could do is just buy $10,000 worth of a one year bond and $9,000 worth of a two year bond and $471 worth of a 30 year bond and so on. Right, nine hundred eighty-five dollars of a twenty-three-year bond. So that would be a cash flow match. That portfolio then would be perfectly hedged. It would have the exact same duration since it would have the exact same cash flows. It would also have the exact same yield curve exposure. So that seems like it might be the optimal solution. So let's talk about why it may not be the optimal solution. Uh, and it, a couple ways of thinking about it. One is. Uh, the need to rebalance a portfolio. This pension liability is based on, say, current number of employees and when they anticipate retiring and so on. And if new employee, employees come in, that would change. Say this forecast were to change every month, right? So you get from another department, maybe HR, they can give you a forecast of pension liabilities. So you wind up in a weird situation every month where, you know, say this number now goes to 1,000 and this number goes to say 800 and this number goes to 700. So what I'd have to do is in this particular month, I'd have to sell off say a little bit of my 20, 24 year bond and uh, buy a little more of my 23 year bond and then sell off a little bit of my 22 year bond. And the problem with this strategy is one is that's, that's a lot of buying and selling of bonds. Two is a, a lot of liquidity in the bond market are on these even number bonds, particularly say the ones, twos, fives, tens, and 30 year bonds. If I try to do a lot of trading with say 17 and 14 and 13 and 27 year bonds, you may not get very good quotes or it might be difficult to, to trade significant quantities without moving the market. So the advantage of this duration matching is I would just get a new forecast of all of my liabilities, recompute duration, say duration went from 659 to 668. Uh, six, well, to get this portfolio to go to 659 to 68, maybe I just need to sell off a little one year and buy a little 30 year and I'd be done. So the reason why that a lot of firms rely on simple duration matching is that it's relatively easy. It focuses on market value and solvency versus say, uh, you know, because your, uh, your durations are matched. 
Uh, also, another reason why you want to do it is a lot of times you may have exposure out to, say, 40 years or, or, or more. So if you just focus on duration, you can try to, you wouldn't be able to, say, do a cash match of a 40-year cash flow, but you can get the average durations to be hedged. And then lastly, as I mentioned, it might be hard to find securities uh, for the specific cash flows you're looking for. But you do have to recognize that you have some exposure to cash flow changes. Now, this basic duration matching procedure we use for a pension fund. It could be also used for insurance companies. Say an insurance company could forecast when they uh, believe uh, mortalities or car accidents or, 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 or whatever uh, they're, trying, they're providing insurance for. They could have an estimate of those uh, cash flows and do a similar activity. Right? So this might be estimates of when uh, car accidents will happen and then what they'll do is they'll invest all the premiums and try to get the durations to be equal. Or a bond broker would try to match the, or match the durations of bonds they've owned versus bond liabilities or bonds they've shorted. And then banks would also use this basic idea that if a bank uh, say issues a, a mortgage or, or, or sells a mortgage to a customer they can calculate the duration of, say, the mortgage and then hold assets to back it uh, or, I'm sorry, funding to back it and try to match the duration of those. So let's do a little example, actually, of a bank. So I'm going to grab this, put it in a new sheet, and then I'll make sure that my duration and convexity formulas are working. So the example we're going to do here is a bank that is going to uh, buy $10 million of mortgages and other loans. So here's an example. They're going to buy 45 auto loans. Each one's worth $20,000. They're going to buy 60 home equity lines of credit, or HELOCs, and 85 mortgages. And then they're going to finance it using this financing scheme of the $10 million they need to buy these assets. I'm actually going to copy these formulas here. They're weighted average duration, convexity, and value. They're going to partially finance this $10 million purchase with $9 million of debt. And they're going to use a mix of 1, 10, and 30-year bonds. And I'll make these quantities negative since they're issuing these bonds. And then I'll add up and get my total equity position. And then I'll copy that formula here. So here's the model for this bank. First of all, let's calculate something called an asset leverage ratio. If I just take the value of assets, 10 million, over the value of equity, 1 million, this bank is using a million dollars of its equity, say issue a million dollars worth of stock, borrows $9 million in the bond market, and now has $10 million of funding, it then invests in these mortgages and loans. Now notice here, these functions here, or these values here for duration and convexity, these are not using Excel's uh, duration and Excel, I'm sorry, duration and convexity formulas that we've been using. Instead, I've put in some values. So what you might find is a 30-year mortgage has a duration of around three and a half and negative convexity, and actually many loans uh, without prepayment with prepayment payment options are going to have negative convexity. So let's talk about mortgages. I talked about this a little bit last time, but here's a reason why a mortgage may have these type of characteristics. A 30-year fixed rate mortgage, uh, if, you, if it lasts the full 30 years, it may have a duration like a 30-year bond, which might be, say, 11 years in this case. But a 30-year mortgage is probably going to have a duration of more like three or four years. And how this is estimated is you're going to have to estimate when homeowners would tend to prepay. Homeowners prepay uh, when they move or unfortunately die or decide to get a smaller house and downsize. Or, so all these reasons, they might re, uh, prepay their mortgage. Okay. So on average, a mortgage may last only three or four or five, six, seven years because people tend to just sell their house for different reasons. And the other reason is they decide to prepay or refinance, I'm sorry, refinance their mortgage. You know, so a customer buys a 30-year mortgage, fully intends it to hold on to it until they move out of their house, but interest rates fall. Say interest rates fall 50 basis points after they enter into the mortgage. Well, they can just mail a check back to the bank for the amount borrowed. 
So the, the duration of that mortgage might go from, say, initially three years, and then rates drop, and then they expect it to come back in a month. So the duration might come back, you know, it might be, you know, 0.1 year. So for that reason, the duration of a 30-year mortgage or a five-year auto loan may only have a duration of three for an auto loan, three and a half for a 30-year mortgage. And also, they're going to have negative convexities. And the concept of negative convexity, what that means is as interest rates fall, the mortgage durations fall. So as interest rates fall, the mortgage is more likely to get prepaid, and therefore its expected life is going to fall. And that's the definition, one of the definitions of negative convexity. So these are not calculated. These are, say, estimates from a prepayment model or Bloomberg or some other analytic um, system. So we're going to try to optimize this portfolio. Specifically, is this a what is the risk of funding these loans using this these set of quantities? So what we're going to do is calculate a portfolio duration and convexity. So let me just calculate a weighted average duration and convexity of equity. So dur duration of my asset is four times the value of the asset plus the duration of liability times the value of the liability divided by the total equity. So this portfolio, you can think of it as the, this net portfolio's value is $1 million with a duration of negative 37 units. And then we can calculate a weighted average convexity. That's the convexity of assets times the value of assets plus convexity of liabilities times the value of liabilities divided by total value of equity. So this portfolio has negative duration and 2,800 negative units of convexity. Now one other measure that banks talk about is just take the duration of assets minus the duration of liabilities. And these would be called the duration and convexity gaps. So in some sense, what you're thinking about it as of managing a bank is you'd like the duration of assets to say roughly be equal to the duration of liabilities. And what you see here is the duration of liabilities is longer than the duration of assets. So you can say our gap is 4.5 years. And same here, we have a gap between the convexity of assets and liabilities. We can calculate one other thing. Let's calculate the pre-tax ROE on this portfolio. Over here, I have the interest income from the mortgages and the interest expense from the bonds the firm's issuing. If I take that interest, net interest income, divided by equity, I got a nice ROE of 21%. So let's think about this portfolio that's leveraged 10 to 1, that there's not a very good mix or match of durations and convexities, and provide a decent ROE. So let's do a simple exercise that we have uh, uh, to look at it. what if all yield changes so all yields change minus 300 basis points minus 200 basis points minus 100 basis points zero and then plus one two and three hundred basis points so what I'm going to do is do a sensitivity analysis of this portfolio to change parallel changes in the yield curve And then I'll calculate value change. That's equity value change. And I'll use my duration and convexity formula. If I take my value of equity, $1 million, I'm going to anchor that, times minus the duration, anchor that, times yield change plus one half convexity anchor times change in yield squared. We learned that this is the formula for calculating value change if you know the duration and convexity of a position. We can see my portfolio if rates are down. It's expected to fall 
by $2.4 million. And by the way, well, the definition of having a negative duration portfolio is normally you, you talk about having bonds have positive duration, meaning they're exposed to rates going up. When you have negative duration, that means you're exposed to rates going down. You can see that it's, it, this portfolio is going way down when rates go down. And I'll calculate the new equity. If I take my change plus my initial equity, anchor that, you can see I'm insolvent if rates are down 300, insolvent if rates are down 200. My equity is cut in half, and I start making a little money if rates are up, and then it starts losing money. So if I were to say graph these positions, my exposure. I'll add a legend to this, or an axis. You can see my exposure looks pretty drastic. Here's the current level of equity, 1 million. And if rates go down, I lose value. When rates go up, I gain, and then start losing again. One way of thinking about this portfolio, I'll just draw a line here. Here's my current portfolio value, 2 million. It has a duration of negative 37 units. What that means is negative duration means you have a positive relationship between interest rates and yield. So you can see as interest rates go up, you gain money. The slope of this value function is positive, which in, means you have negative duration. Remember I taught you a lot, or, or mentioned last time that uh, or Standard bonds have positive duration. However, that means there's an inverse relationship between price and yield, but we always quote, quote duration as a positive number. When you actually see a negative duration, that actually means there's a, a direct relationship, positive relationship between value and yield. So you can think of this the slope of this line being 37 in some sense. And the fact you have negative convexity means that the value bows down from there. So this is a portfolio with negative duration and negative convexity. So let's try to form a portfolio that's not going to go bankrupt. So let's do uh, something we did last time. Let's uh, run a solver and find a better mix. And let's go ahead first do, let's try to maximize portfolio income. Right now I'm getting a 20% ROE with 216,000 of net interest income. By changing the bond quantities. I'm going to uncheck them. I actually make, want to make sure that the bond quantities are always negative. In this case, because the firm is issuing bonds. So let me add a constraint that each one of these are less than or equal to zero. Let's add a constraint that my equity duration, negative 37, I want that to be equal to zero. So now I'm going to maximize income by changing the weights. The weights are negative, and my duration is greater than or equal to zero. And I'm going to add one more constraint. Constraint constrains the total value. In this case, let me just, uh, I can either do one, one of several constraints. I can either constrain leverage to 10, equity to a million, or liabilities equal to 9 million. But if your strategy is you want to only use a million to control 10 million of assets, I can, I can constrain any of those. Let me just uh, constrain the leverage to be equal to 10. So I'm going to maximize income by changing the weights. The weights are negative. Uncheck this box. Leverage is 10 and duration is 0. And see if I can try to get a profile where I don't go bankrupt. Okay. This looks a little bit better. I'm getting, actually getting 36% ROEs. And I only go bankrupt under extreme rate changes. Look like almost 300 basis point change in rates is the only time I go bankrupt. And let me just show you this picture. This is a classic picture in bank management. This is a picture of zero duration, meaning my tangent line at the current portfolio value or my slope of my 
value yield function is zero currently, but I have negative convexity, meaning if rates change in any direction, I'm going to lose. But if you look, I don't really lose that much money. Right? Versus losing millions of million or a million and a half left before, you know, I, I, I only go bankrupt in the extreme event that rates are falling almost by 300 basis points or up by 300 basis points. So this is a much better profile than before. And my ROEs look pretty strong. Now one other thing if we're worried about con uh, convexity, convexity is reason why this portfolio is losing. I can maybe try to run it to maximize convexity. So data solver. Let's just maximize convexity instead. So right now it's negative 2234 units. Well, it looks like a, yeah, the same solution. But those are the two types of solvers that I can think of for managing a bank in this manner. I would want to set duration equal to zero to reduce our chances of going bankrupt and then maybe maximizing convexity or maximizing income or maybe maximizing convexity with a constraint on income or maximizing income with a constraint on convexity. So that's our model of the banking business. And we were able through duration hedging to reduce our exposure to look like this where we're going uh, extremely bankrupt when rates fall to a better exposure. So hopefully in this topic you've learned how to manage the interest rate risk of a fixed income portfolio using duration. Talked about what effective duration is. Effective duration is the average percent change in value for 100 basis point change in rates. And we computed portfolio value, income, duration, convexity uh, using market value weighted duration and convexity. And then we optimized a pension funding liability using assets with the same duration and maximizing convex convexity or income. And then we optimize a bank model in which a bank is leveraged 10 to 1 